Okay, so how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. So it is uh, Saturday, August 31st, 2019, and uh, we are live. And I was trying to broadcast on, um, I was trying to broadcast on Facebook Live, but that wasn't working. So we are here on YouTube, okay? Hope everybody's doing well today. And I wanted to talk about this topic here. Um, I saw an article from thegrio.com, and I see people logging on right now. How's everybody doing? And I got to change the uh, the uh, picture that's associated with this. I didn't know it was about to go live, but anyway, <laughs> you know, those are things that happen. Um, I, I saw this article from first thegrio.com, okay, thegrio.com from um, August 28th, 2019. And uh, they have an article entitled New Study Prompts Questions About Diabetes and Obesity uh, with Black Churches, okay? New Study Prompts Questions About Diabetes and Obesity with Black Churches. So I read the article and then I read uh, the source article, which is from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Okay, and uh, I looked at some of the information regarding this regarding this study from uh, Duke University. And what this study does is it looks at the correlation between obesity and diabetes in the African American community, and the frequency which um, people. Uh, it, the frequency which African Americans go to church, and they look at it based upon um, denomination as well. Okay, they look at it based upon uh, denomination. Okay, and they, and one of the denominations they looked at was uh, the Baptist denomination. All right. So first off, I just want to say this: this quick disclaimer. Right. This is not an attack on the African American church. This is not an attack on the black church or anything like that, okay? I'm not telling people don't go to church or what have you, all right? But I'm gonna share with you some uh, things that I have noticed in African-American churches when they serve food, okay? And I speak at, you know, especially during the month of February for African-American History Month, you know, this past February, I spoke at a number of different, probably seven to eight African-American churches uh, I spoke at, okay? So uh, everybody share this broadcast and uh, invite your friends to tune in also. And let's look at this. Uh, let's look at I'm going to look at the article from uh, the Grio and more extensively, the article from um, the Atlanta Journal Constitution to break this down. OK. All right. And let me post this here on uh, Facebook as well. OK, so if we look at the article from the uh, Grio.com, new study prompts questions about diabetes and obesity uh, with uh, black churches. OK, they talk about how diabetes and obesity rates could possibly have a correlation, could possibly have a correlation with church going among African Americans, a new study suggests. Uh, the findings of the Duke University study released last month in the Journal of Religion and Health highlight two main conclusions, highlight two main conclusions. One, African Americans who are Baptists, okay, African Americans who are Baptists, are more likely to have diabetes than those who are Catholic or Presbyterian, okay? African-Americans who are Baptists are more likely to have diabetes than those who are Catholic or Presbyterian. And two, African-American men who go to church five or more times a week are three times more likely to be obese than those who seldom or rarely attend church, okay? And this was also reported by the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. All right, so uh, if we dig deeper into this, and let me see here, I want to go to, uh, I was trying to figure out how to, um, okay, here we go, edit video. All right, so if we dig deeper into this, uh, let's look at what, what is behind this. And the article from the Atlanta Journal Constitution is, is really good with this. Um, so this was a study done by uh, Duke University. All right. And researchers are not saying church attendance causes uh, diabetes or, or obesity. This is not what they're saying. Only that there is a correlation, said Keisha L. Bentley Edwards, who's the associate director of research and director of the health equity 
working group at the Cook Center. Additional research would, would be needed to find out how they are connected, she said. Now, Keisha Bentley Edwards, who also teaches general internal medicine, said considerable health research has been done comparing the traits of white Christians to black Christians. But there has been relatively little work that has been done looking at differences between denominations of black Christians or between black members of the same denomination who have different roles in the church and who participate in church to different degrees. OK, so there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Now, one third of, of Americans, one third of Americans in general. Are uh, what are considered obese, and that's based upon the B BMI body mass index. OK, you can go somewhere like Web uh, WebMD.com, WebMD.com and search for body mass index, uh, body mass index, BMI. Or you can look at BlackDoctor.org, BlackDoctor.org is a really, really good uh, source for um, African-American uh, news and studies pertaining to the African-American community dealing with health. And they have a lot of African-American doctors there that uh, are in, you know, that write articles, et cetera. Okay, so um, uh, blackdoctor.org, okay, is a really, really good uh, resource. And I, you know, I, I follow them on Facebook. Oftentimes I post, uh, some of their articles uh, also, okay? All right, so um, the News and Observer publication, News and Observer publication, there was an interview done with uh, uh, Keisha um, Bentley Edwards. And in the uh, interview, she said, uh, she said, we wanted to look at nuances within the black church and not just treat the black church as not just treat the black church as a monolithic group with no diversity within it. OK, we wanted to look at nuances within the black church and not just treat the black church as a monolithic group with no diversity within it. So the team used an existing database, the National Survey of American Life, the National Survey of American Life uh, database. Uh, and and uh, this database was conducted, was put together in the early 2000s. But they used this database to compare certain traits among African-Americans and Afro-Caribbeans with those of white respondents living in the same communities. Now, Lanike uh, Blackman Carr, C-A-R-R, who helped with the research and also teaches at the University of Connecticut, said uh, that the National Institutes of Health provided funding for the project in part because African-Americans are disproportionately affected by diabetes and obesity, okay? Now you have about a third of American men and women who are obese, but nearly half of African-American men and women are obese, okay? So, uh, so obesity is afflicting the African-American community more so than the overall white community. And there are a number of different contributing factors to this. All right. And obesity also ties into life expectancy. We also know that it is more expensive. It's more expensive to be sick in America than it is to be healthy in America as well. All right. So all of this uh, is connected. All right. And once again, this is not an attack on the African-American church or anything like that. But well, all of this is connected. Your your the uh, foods that you eat contribute to your overall health. Your overall health contribute to how much it costs to stay alive in America. We know that people who are sicker tend to, tend to have more uh, prescriptions. Prescriptions oftentimes have side effects. Then you have to take drugs to address the side effects of the prescriptions that you took in the first place to address your high blood pressure, your diabetes, your water retention, your gout, Whatever the whatever the illness is, okay, and then um, when we look at things like food deserts in the African American community, so lack of proper grocery stores where you can get fresh fruits, you you are uh, bombarded with fast food restaurants, one on every corner, things like this, that ties into zoning laws that are in your communities. That ties into the zoning board. The zoning board uh, largely controls how many types of businesses you can have in a particular city, 
um, and it, it, it and it deals with uh, everything from liquor stores to grocery stores to fast food restaurants. All that deals with the zoning board. That deals with politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, this is what politics is. So all of this is interconnected and interrelated. A lot of times people look at this and try to dissect it from the whole. They try to compartmentalize this, okay? But no, this is all interrelated and interconnected, all right? So the better we understand uh, about how these uh, different issues are interrelated and interconnected to each other, the better we can work to correct these issues, correct the problems, all right? Okay, how's everybody doing? Uh, be sure to follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, um, as well on Facebook. And uh, look out for me on the uh, Black Agenda Tour with uh, Michi X and Jice Johnson. Uh, coming to a city near you, hopefully. Our next stop is Orlando, Orlando, Florida, in October 12th. Okay, so visit the Black Agenda on Tour.com for more information. The Black Agenda on Tour.com for more information. All right. All right, let's continue. And I'm trying to, uh, I had to change the profile picture because that was uh, just a default profile picture that came up of. Um, from another broadcast I did. I didn't even know it was going to do that. And I'm broadcasting through Zoom and Zoom was giving me a problem trying to broadcast on Facebook. So here we are on YouTube, okay? All right, so let's continue. So the team uh, used the existing database, uh, database, the National Survey of American Life that was put together in uh, the early 2000s, all right? To compare certain traits among African-Americans and Afro-Caribbeans with those of white respondents uh, living in the same communities, okay? With those of white respondents living in the same communities. All right, so uh, let's see here. All right, now, uh, churches, especially those with a predominantly African-American membership, have long been recognized for their potential in improving the health and wellness of their members uh, uh, of those in of their members and those in their communities. All right. So a 2002 study in the American Journal of Public Health found that African American churches provide more uh, provide many more health related services than white churches, whether they are in rural or urban settings. Okay. A 2002 study in the American Journal of Public Health found that. African American churches provide many more health related services than white churches, whether they are in rural or urban settings. Those included prevention and treatment oriented programs, as well as health screening, education and support, the study said. And when we look at the fact that African Americans are, 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 are more likely to be uninsured, okay, then we see that this was um, this. The fact that African-American churches in general provide many more health related services than white churches would largely be expected because more African-Americans are uninsured than white Americans. Now, the one one of the things, one of the positive things that the Affordable Health Care Act did, what is ostensibly known as Obamacare, is it reduced the uninsured rate for African-Americans. The uninsured rate for African-Americans dropped to the lowest point uh, in history because of the Affordable Health Care Act, it dropped down to like 10%, okay? So even though it was still a higher, it was a still a higher uninsured rate for African-Americans than it was for white people, that's the lowest it's been in history. Something else that the, uh, that the Affordable Health Care Act did was that it, um, it gave uh, 3 million non-elderly African-Americans health insurance who did not already have health insurance. 3 million non-elderly African-Americans got health insurance who did not already have health insurance. And this led to um, African-Americans having the longest life expectancy uh, in the history of this country, okay, because of the Affordable Health Care Act. So I encourage people to um, read the document, uh, Progress of the African-American Community Under the Obama Administration. That's at, his, that's at um, whitehouse.gov, whitehouse.gov, okay? 
in every city I lecture in, I ask people about it. Nobody's read it. I'm not exactly sure why they haven't read it. I'm not exactly sure why. Usually people don't know about it. I'm not exactly sure why they don't know about it. But that's at whitehouse.gov. Okay. Whitehouse.gov is the official website of the White House. It's still there at whitehouse.gov. Uh, Trump is not taking it down yet. And I have a copy of it here because I had it with me in, uh, what was our last? Brooklyn. Speaking in Brooklyn last weekend on the Black Agenda Tour. And I talked about it there. So uh, I'm trying to find it somewhere here in all these uh, articles I have. But go to whitehouse.gov and just search for uh, progress of the African-American community in the Obama administration. And what this, what this document does is it shows you the, um, how a lot of the policies from the Obama administration positively impacted the African-American community. And a lot of these policies are under attack right now by Donald Trump, or they have been reversed by Trump. Trump has reversed uh, probably about close to now, close to about, uh, here we go right here. I knew it was in this stack. Trump has reversed about 200 policies that uh, President Obama had in place, okay? Trump has reversed about 200 policies that uh, President Obama had in place. Now it's probably close to about 200. So this document right here, because I printed up copies of it and I take this with me, uh, you know, when I go speak. So this is progress of the African-American community under the Obama administration. Now, this doesn't even include the fact that the U.S. prison population dropped to its lowest point in 20 years under the Obama administration. Uh, December 2015, the U.S. prison population dropped down to 1.53 million. Um, and this it dropped from a peak of 2.3 million down to 1.53 million. The uh, percentage of African-Americans in prison dropped from 40 percent down to 34 percent. That's not even talked about. I'm not sure why it's not talked about. Um, I'm not sure why. People are not talking about, you know, 2013, Attorney General Eric Holder instituted the Smart on Crime initiative that backed off of charging low-level nonviolent drug offenders with the longest, harshest sentences, and this contributed to a reduction in the overall U.S. prison population, as well as to the percentage of African Americans in prison. And then when Jeff Sessions, Donald Trump's first Attorney General, when Jeff Sessions uh, became Attorney General, he reversed that policy. He called it soft on crime. I'm not sure why. Many people don't talk about this, including African-Americans, but I, 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 I don't know. I can't figure it out. Um, but the, the, uh, Newsweek.com has an article dealing with that. And then I actually read the Department of Justice report that came out December 2016 that talked about that as well. OK, so we'll post a link here for this. Uh, but read this. So when we so when I talk about. Uh, uh, six Principles of Political Self-Defense was a lecture that I do, and I do this presentation on the Black Agenda Tour. Then I talk about how to assess and protect our, our gains that were made. This is one of the things I'm talking about. Because if you haven't read this document, you don't understand the gains that were made, so you don't understand what needs to be protected. You don't understand what's under attack. Okay? So this is an example of how elections have consequences. This is an example of how elections have consequences. All right, so let's continue. How's everybody doing? We have Vigilant, we have um, uh, King Chai, uh, Ernie, uh, Char, Zo Zozier, Priscilla Barnes. How's everybody doing? Jade. Hey, Jade Harrell, how you doing? Okay, so Jade was on the Black, Atour, uh, Black Agenda Tour with us in Brooklyn, and I think she's going to be in one other city, but I'm not sure which one, so I don't want to say it on the air and then you show up and she's not there, then you get mad at me. But go to the Black Agenda on tour.com and uh, you can figure out, you can see which one she's gonna be at next, okay? Well, if you wanna post which one you're gonna be at next, Jay, just let me know. How you doing, Wise Warrior? Also, very quickly, everybody, um, you can order Hidden Colors 5 from my website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. With each copy of Hidden Colors 5 you purchase, you'll get three of my uh, digital downloads uh, of my presentations included with this, including six principles of political self-defense, how laws and policies impact the economic conditions of African-Americans. That's one of the three digital downloads you'll get of my presentations free with, with each copy of Hidden Colors 5 that you purchase. All right. So we'll post this in this at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Also, we'll post this link here. OK, so let's continue here. And I'm looking at the article from um, 
Atlanta Journal Constitution. So a key to reducing diabetes and obesity rates lies in finding how these health issues might be connected to religion, the researchers say. Are, they, are there high glycemic specialties in Black Baptist churches and Black Baptist churches covered dish uh, repertoires that are missing from Black Catholic and Presbyterian gatherings. So what they're saying is, in Black Baptist churches, are they eating food after church, Bible study? Are they eating food in Black Baptist churches that they're not eating at, at Black Catholic churches and Black Presbyterian churches or gatherings, okay? Now, are men who attend church nearly every day of the week sneaking comfort food leftovers from the fellowship hall? Are, 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 um, are there leaders of the church who are so busy they are overly, they, uh, they eat, they are overeating on high calorie drive through restaurant food? Does it matter that some denominations stress more than others the Bible's teaching about the body being a temple? Do black churches need to offer exercise classes tailored for male members? Okay, these are these are all questions. And one thing um, I noticed is that uh, a, a few things. I, I, I attended a prayer breakfast a few years ago for an African American member of city council here in the city of Detroit, and this city council member was under uh, attack by the media. Okay, and. So I usually don't go to church. Those that know me know that. Okay. Now I grew up. I, now I grew up Catholic until I was 13 years old, and my dad told me you don't have to go back to the church if you don't want to, and I ain't go back. All right. So in Catholic, so the church that I went to when I was Catholic was 75% white, and we didn't have food after. We didn't have food after church. The uh, mass was 45 minutes. Okay, and you know you get the communion, you get the little bread and the wine. And, you know, you stand around and talk to people and then you're out of there. All right. So we, we didn't go to uh, we didn't have uh, food after church service and we didn't go to Cracker Barrel or IHOP or uh, was it a, a old country buffet? We didn't do that after church. All right. And what I noticed with a lot of African-Americans uh, when we had a, a family reunion a few years ago, one of my cousins by marriage is a pastor up in Flint, Michigan. So we went to his church. And then after church, we went to, uh, out to lunch, the whole family and, you know, went out to lunch and some of the church members, I think also. And I looked at the food that they were eating. Now I've been a vegetarian for 12 years. So this is why this whole Popeye's chicken sandwich thing. That's why you haven't seen me talk about it a whole lot. I've been a vegetarian for 12 years, so I don't I don't mess with any of that stuff. But I'm looking at the food that they're eating and they're eating fried chicken and ham. They, they're eating all this high calorie food, put potato salad, all this stuff. Right. And. I noticed the same thing you'll see when people go. Um, uh, I, I noticed the same thing when I went to this prayer breakfast. Right. So. At the prayer breakfast, you had people who were talking about the devil is trying to take this city council person down and we need to fight against the devil and things like this. Right. So then they serve breakfast. So after all the speeches, everything, then they serve breakfast. OK, so here's what they serve. They serve fried chicken. They serve ham. They serve bacon, sausage, grits, scrambled eggs. The only thing that I could have, well, I think they had toast. The only thing that I could have was orange juice and they have fruit cocktail. The fruit cocktail was in syrup. So I'm not even sure if I had the fruit cocktail. This is what they served, right? So one of the things I did was I looked around at the people who was eating the food because I'm a vegetarian. So most of this stuff I can't eat. And I saw a lot of overweight African Americans, a few of them on rest, a few of them on oxygen tanks. I kid you not, a few of them on oxygen oxygen tanks. And I'm looking at them going to get this food, and they're waddling and wheezing and things like this, right? So I'm sitting here observing all this, and I'm saying, you are talking about this city council person 
being attacked by the devil and the devil's trying to take them down, but you're serving death on a plate. So the same people who were talking about the devil trying to take this city council person down are just readily and, you know, just they, they, they have no problem eating this food that's killing them. So I'm not saying every church is like this, but a lot of them are. It, is, it doesn't mean that they are bad people. I'm not attacking. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not attacking them. But I just find it interesting that you talk about, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, you talk about a mythological devil attacking people, but we're eating death on a plate with no problem. So this is why our whole mindset has to be changed. This is why our whole mindset has to be uh has to be rewired okay all right so and then I, I remember um so so we had that the prayer breakfast okay and then uh the family reunion we went to dinner um uh, sorry we went to um lunch after church service and all the people i think we went to old country buffet something like that all the people eating all this fried food eating all this garbage right um i remember i had a meeting um, with a friend of mine who lives near near me, and we we had a business meeting, and we met at a soul food restaurant that's like right near me. Okay, he wanted to go to the so we were trying to figure out where could we meet, and we wanted to go to African American owned business also. So we went to the soul food restaurant. Now I usually don't go to soul food restaurants. I go I, 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 if I do, I go to Vegan Soul here in Detroit, um, east side of Detroit, off of Jefferson Vegan Soul. So. We went to the soul food restaurant and one, they didn't have salad. And, you know, I'm talking to the waitress and they didn't have salad because I'm a vegetarian. And I've heard people say, well, most soul food restaurants don't have salad. Well, when you study business and my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing, I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. There's something called a competitive advantage. There's something called a competitive advantage. And the competitive advantage is something that you do better than other people. And it's something that separates you from the other people, from the other businesses, right? So if the other soul food restaurants don't have salad, don't serve salad, and you know more African-Americans are becoming more health conscious or have become more health conscious or need to become more health conscious, why wouldn't you serve salad? Okay, but she said she didn't, they didn't serve salad. I said, okay. So I ordered... Uh, collard greens, I think they were collards, collard greens and sweet potatoes. And I eat the sweet potatoes and I ask, do these sweet potatoes have sugar on them? She said, yes. I'm like, why would you put sugar on sweet potatoes? I don't understand this. So when I eat at a restaurant, I have a habit of looking at the other people around in the restaurant. And I look at what condition they, they are in. I do the same thing when I go to Sam's Club, where the warehouse club, right? Because at Sam's Club, usually this is not an attack on anybody, but it's from a marketing background, having a background in marketing, understanding crafting messages, having a background in sales. These are things I pay attention to. Usually when I see overweight people shopping for food, I look in their basket. I can see why they're overweight because I can see the food that they're eating. Also, one of the things I do is I look at overweight parents. And I look at their children. Usually the children are overweight because they're eating the same food that the parents are eating. So if they're five or six years old, if, they don't, if they're not overweight yet, if they keep eating the food that the parents are eating, they're going to be overweight also. OK, so one of, the things, one of the things I did at the soul food restaurant was uh, I looked around at the other people in their eating. I see people eating fried chicken, big plates of fried chicken. They eat they're drinking Coca-Cola. And I see a large number of overweight people. Now, most of the people in, in, are older, probably 50, 60, something like that. I see a large number of overweight people, African-Americans, all black people. I saw some of them, uh, at least one or two, on oxygen tanks as well. And they're eating death on a plate. Now, I'm not attacking soul food restaurants. But, I mean, you know, at some point we have to, I know in the, I understand our history and understand foods that we ate during slavery. I understand that. Chattel slavery is over with. 
So we have to ask the question, why do we still eat chitlins? I can understand slaves eating chitlins. They didn't have a choice. Why are you still eating chitlins? Some people make the argument that slave food causes you to have a slave mentality. This is not an attack on soul food restaurants. You know, the TV show uh, Sweetie Pies, I really like that TV show Sweetie Pies. But you got to have healthier options <laughs> on your menu if you love black people. OK, because a lot of the food that we're eating are killing us. And this helps your business. This will help you help your business as well. Let me give you an example. If you have a group of people and they're deciding which restaurant to go eat and you got two or three vegetarians in the group. If you don't have vegetarian options on your menu, then they may end up going somewhere else so everybody could get something on the menu. If you have people who have problems with heart disease and diabetes and their doctor is putting them on a, on a, uh, on a, a diet, right, to save their lives, and it's a group of people that want to go and eat at a restaurant, they may not be vegetarian. But they say, well, look, we can go here to this soul food restaurant because they have some healthier options. So if you want, if you still want to get chitlins, you want fried chicken, you can do that. And then also they have healthier, heart friendly options for people who are trying to lose weight, people who had a heart attack, people who had a stroke, et cetera. So you can still capture some of that business. Then also, if you serve healthier food, it can contribute to the longevity and an extended lifespan of your customers, which means they will stay alive longer, which means they can spend more money with you. See, that's the entrepreneurial teacher in me talking, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so we have to understand how all this is intersected and how all of it interrelates. I need, I need to really teach an online course dealing with entrepreneurship, okay? I really, really need to do that. I've been kicking this around. You know, I do, I do an online course eight week online course, uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And, uh, you can register for that at, uh, African history network.com that meets on Thursdays, 8 PM Eastern standard time. We'll post a link here also. Okay. That's uh we do with thousands of years of history, et cetera, but I really, really need to teach an online course dealing with, um, uh, entrepreneurship. And, 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 and see, when I teach entrepreneurship, I teach it specifically from an African-American perspective. I, I teach it specifically from an African-American perspective because, and I incorporate history into it. All right. So that's what I need to do. Cause I have lectures where I do this lectures on DVD, like 13 forms of wealth, but um, I really need to do an online course dealing with that. And I, and I relate um, different principles, different business principles to successful African-American historical figures also. So that's what I need. That's something I need to do for 2019. Okay. For the one nine, I need to do an online course. All right. And then I could really do another online course dealing with how everything you want to learn about business. You can learn from watching the 122 episodes of Sanford and Son. Okay. Because <laughs> I got stuff on that too. All right. <laughs> I have all six seasons of Sanford and Son on DVD. Everything you want to learn about business acquisitions and mergers, diversification of your portfolio, advertising, inventory management, uh, all that stuff you can learn from watching Sanford and Son as well. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's see who we have here. Char, uh, Kaim. Uh, I have not eaten chick chicken ever, Kaim said. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm telling you, you watch you. I, I can also teach a history class from uh, topics discussed on the TV show Sanford and Son as well. Everything from the Watergate scandal to uh, the uh, women's liberation movement, all that stuff also to uh, the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Uh, Cause I learned, I learned about the watch with the watch rise. I learned about the watch rise from watching Sanford and Sons. Uh, Fred and Lamont Sanford lived at 9114 South Central Avenue in Watts. And I, I first, uh, I think that was one of the first times I heard about the Watts riots from watching Sanford and the Sun. And the Watts riots then are connected to the 1967 Detroit Rebellion, 
or we should call it Watts Rebellion. They call it the riots on the show. That's connected to the uh, 1967 Detroit Rebellion, for, uh, which was June 23rd to June 28th, June 23rd to June 27th, 1967. And the day after the Detroit Rebellion ended, then President Johnson convened the uh, Kerner Commission, the Commission uh, uh, on Civil Disorders, the, the Kerner Commission. OK, and then the Kerner Commission report came out March of uh, 1968. Dr. King was assassinated the next month, April 4th, 1968. And then you had 125 violent uprisings and rebellions and things like this uh, because of uh, Dr. King's assassination. Right. So I could teach a, I could teach a history class based upon the topics talked about on the TV show Sanford and Son. But that's just how my mind thinks. OK, so back to this. How's everybody doing? All right. If you like this type of information, also, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, or visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. So let's go back to this article from um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Duke researchers find, difference, find differences among denominations as well as between men and women. Duke researchers, Duke University. Uh, find differences among denominations, uh, talking about Christian denominations, as well as between men and women. OK, so let's continue. So they ask, a, a, you know, a, a number of different questions. Are um, African-American pastors and ministers, are they uh, so busy that they are overeating high calorie uh, food or going through drive through restaurants? Does it matter that some denominations stress more than others the Bible's teachings? about the body being a temple? Do African-American churches need to offer exercise classes tailored for male members, all right? So um, Dr. Carr uh, said, uh, quote, we can't wait to talk with some people. We can't wait to talk with some people, okay? To try to find some explanations that might lead to custom interventions. Quote, what this research shows is that one size does not fit all, end quote. What, what this research shows is that one size does not fit all, okay? Um, so this is a very, very uh, interesting article. So this is the one from Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And it causes um, people or should cause people to start asking questions and to look at the food that is served uh, at the church to look at the food that is served at the church, the food that is served at the Bible study, the food that is served, uh, uh, and also the food that people eat when they go to lunch after church service on Sunday. And once again, the two um, main findings of this study are that African-Americans identifying as Baptists are more likely to have diabetes than those who identify as Catholic or Presbyterian, okay? than African-Americans who identify as Catholic and Presbyterian. And African-American men who go to church five or more times a week are three times more likely to be obese than their African-American male counterparts who sell, seldom or rarely attend church. All right, so this uh, causes you to, this should cause us to start doing a lot of thinking. And, I, and also I think that African-American churches uh, many of them, if not all of them, should have some type, should offer some type of um, exercise classes as well. Because when we go back and look, as the, as the article state, one third of Americans are obese, male and females. One third of Americans are obese, but almost half of African American male and females are obese. It's about 48%. OK, because I, I went and looked at some of the information from the studies, about 48 percent or so of African-American adults are obese. And once again, this impacts your quality of life. This impacts your life expectancy, your lifespan. This impacts your finances because it's expensive to be sick in America. So the sicker you are, the more money you have to spend to address these issues. OK. So this has a wide ranging impact. And then look at the original article from thegrio.com. New study prompts questions about diabetes and obesity within black churches. All right, let's look at some of your comments here. Um, Al, how you doing, Al? Uh, Gis Giselle, I love it. Okay, okay, Giselle was laughing, I think me talking about Sanford and Son. Uh, let's see who else we have here. Post any questions you have and then 
African-American business owners also, you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network on our live broadcast and the podcast of our Sunday night show, the African History Network show. All right, so a lot of people are looking at investing uh, right now. They're looking at the stock market uh, at various times and they want to learn more about investing. Well, the profitroom.com can help. You may have seen the interviews I've done uh, with uh, those at theprofitroom.com. Uh, this is a stock market trading and education company that has mentorship programs. They have mentorship programs uh, that are designed for beginners. They teach individuals like yourself how to create generational wealth so we can pass down wealth from to our children and our grandchildren as opposed to bills. And they do this through uh, trading and investing in the financial markets. You can learn about the foreign exchange markets, the stock markets, uh, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, and New York Stock Exchange. You can learn about options and the future markets as well. Now, their specialty is in day trading. Their specialty is in day trading, day trading, and they offer also one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Visit their website, theprofitroom.com, theprofitroom.com uh, for more information and let them know you found out about this from uh, Michael M. Hotep and the African History Network, okay? Theprofitroom.com. All right, let's look at some of your comments here. Okay, let's see who we have here. Okay, if you have any comments, go ahead and post those. We'll come to those as well. All right, now, my Sunday night show, people, uh, you know, I, was, I, was, I spoke at the uh, African World Festival here in Detroit. Um, was that uh, the third weekend in Atlanta? I mean, third weekend in August, not Atlanta. I was in Atlanta, June, July, and August. Um, and people were asking, what's going on with your Sunday night show, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation? Well, they're playing Major League Baseball on Saturdays around 3 p.m. and Sundays starting at about 6 p.m., Major League Baseball games, okay? And these are not even Tiger Baseball games. So uh, the games last on average three, three and a half hours, whatever it is. So uh, my show is 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. A lot of times these games, the coverage will start at 6 p.m., but the game won't start until 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it has been preempting my show. So I haven't been on live on the air in a number of weeks. And also I've been in and out of town as well, speaking at events, et cetera. OK, so be sure to follow me on YouTube, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Subscribe here. Because all my videos that I do outside of 910, you'll, you get to watch here. Uh, and uh, turn on the notifications as well. So when we go live, uh, you'll know when we go live also. And you'll also be notified when we upload new videos. Like I just interviewed Bob Law when I was in Brooklyn last weekend. I interviewed Bob Law about the uh, Respect Us campaign dealing with cleaning up the airwaves of indecent and obscene uh, music. OK, so watch that interview I did with Bob Law and then also follow us on our uh, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network on Facebook, because uh, dealing with August 20th, 1619, uh, the 400th anniversary of uh, Africans being brought into uh, Virginia, Point Comfort in Virginia on that uh, English warship, actually English pirate ship, pirate ship, the uh, White Lion. I did a series of interviews surrounding that and dealing with the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years. So a lot of you have been watching those interviews I did. We put them here on our YouTube channel, but I did them on Facebook. I interviewed uh, some of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, Professor James Small, and Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman. So they're all in Hidden Colors 5. And uh, you've seen me interview them a uh, number of times the past few years. And I also interviewed Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. He wrote this book right here, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And this book deals with the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years ago, documented evidence of this. And it talks about the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They are the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Khoisan go all around the world and they were here in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. And the, uh, um, we know they were in South, uh, what we call South Carolina. They build pyramid mounds up and down the Mississippi River. 
At one point, there were about 1 million mounds in this land that we call the contiguous United States. Contiguous means connected. Okay, so that does not include Alaska and Hawaii because they're not connected to this land mass that we call the contiguous United States. Uh, they built pyramid mounds all throughout this land. Uh, today, there are only about 100,000 mounds left. Okay, one of the largest mounds that still exists is called Cohoikia in East Illinois. All right. But the Khoisan were here before Native Americans even came into existence. So be sure to watch those uh, four interviews I did. People have been watching those and they're blown away by the information. Let's look at some of your comments here. Uh, Kaim said, I've read, we hid okra seeds in our hair in Russell Simmons' book, The Arab Invasion, may have changed many customs in 100 AD. Um, What's the name of the book that you read? And I take it you're not talking about Russell Simmons and Def Jam. Um, but I, I, uh, face-to-faceafrica.com has an article dealing with um, how we, how cornrows were used as a map for Africans who were enslaved to navigate to freedom. And also it dealt with us hiding uh, rice in our hair so we can uh, have something to eat if we got captured in wall slave ships. Okay, face to face africa.com has an article dealing with that. And we'll try to post the uh, link to the article here because I have thousands of articles bookmarked. This one is called, and I have it bookmarked. Um, this one is called How Hair Was Used to Smuggle Grains into the Caribbean by African Slaves. How Hair Was Used to Smuggle Grains. Uh, into the Caribbean by African slaves. This is written by Elizabeth uh, Ofo uh, Sua Johnson. It sounds like a Yoruba name. Um, During the horrifying slave trade, Africans that were captured and forced onto ships to be sold into bondage in the Caribbean, par uh, in the Caribbean, parts of Europe and the United States of America experienced some of the worst treatments ever. Uh, for one, okay, so let me see, let me skip some past some of this. Uh, many slaves who managed to survive and land on coffee, cotton, or sugar uh, plantations still struggle for food. Their masters did not allow them to eat much or gain access to food stuff or enough money to purchase it. According to history, descendants of enslaved Africans of Suriname uh, traced their ancestry to West Africa and parts of Central Africa. Um, According to in-depth research conducted by Judith Carney, C-A-R-N-E-Y, a rice historian and geography professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, revelations indicate that some slaves were fully prepared to be captured or had enough time to store the grains, grains of rice, on their body before embarking on the never-to-return trips. In her book, Black Rice, Black Rice, Professor Carney, gives a full account of the dark and hard grained rice that came from West Africa and how slaves taught their white masters how to grow and preserve it, rice, years before rice from Asia became a preferred option. In order to have something to keep them going, captured Africans often swallowed okra seeds and rice. According to oral history, these seeds could be repicked and swallowed when it came out in one species, okay? Although it may not be well reported in books or academic findings, rice found, it, found its way to the Caribbean by being kept in women's braids. According to several articles, including Professor Carney's book, Black Rice, African women braided their hair and hid rice seeds as well as other grains in cornrows. The uh, braiding technique was very popular among Africans, which was taken into the Caribbean, especially among the Maroon community. So, uh, so Maroon, uh, uh, mothers often braided the rice into their children's hair to have something to survive on while on the slave trips or escaping from raided communities in Africa. So when we look at Maroon communities, we, we hear about uh, Queen Nanny and the Jamaican Maroons, right? Uh, so maroon comes from the Spanish word cimarron. Cimarron means runaway slave. And the word seminal, as in Florida Seminoles, Native Americans, the word seminal and the word maroon both come from the Spanish word cimarron. 
All right. So when you uh, look up uh, Maroon in the dictionary and look at the etymology, it's going to take you back to Cimarron. And when we look at Queen Anne and Jamaican Maroons, we know Jamaica was uncovered by Columbus in 1494 in the name of the Spanish crown. And then Jamaica is going to come under control of the British. So uh, uh, Nanny and the Jamaican Maroons, they're fighting against the British and beat them so badly, they forced them into a peace treaty about 1739. And what you're going to find, this is one of the things that we do with in the online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, is that these European nations originally were groups of Germanic people collectively called barbarians, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombard, the Picts, the Allens, the Franks, things like this. And they're going to have kingdoms. And these kingdoms are then going to be formed into nations. But these kingdoms, the, these Germanic people, these barbarians were fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years. They're going to be formed into nations that are going to continue to fight and kill each other for hundreds of years. So then when the Portuguese and the Spanish, because the Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, going back to about 1440, and the Spanish were right behind them. They had been dealing with the Africans known as the Moors for hundreds of years. The Moors go in in 711 AD. When you look at a map, they're going through Morocco from Morocco into what was then called the Iberian Peninsula. It wasn't called Spain and Portugal at, the, at that time. Spain and Portugal, or the Iberian Peninsula, is right above Morocco. So they're going into Morocco. They're fighting against the Vandals and the Visigoths, two other groups of Germanic people who've been fighting and killing, have been fighting each other and, 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 you know, for hundreds of years. And the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 AD. And they cast Europe into the Dark Ages, okay? And they go, uh, the, the Moors are fighting against the Vandals and the Visigoths. They defeat them. They settle them in the, in the uh, southern area of what today we call Spain. They called it Al-Andalus, Al-Andalus. And the Moors are going to go through, you have millions of them going into Europe uh, over the course of hundreds of years. And they go all throughout Europe. They go into Spain, Portugal, France, Italy. Uh, they go into Crete. Uh, Cis uh, they go into Crete, uh, Sicily, uh, Sicily. Um, they go into uh, England, Austria, Germany, et cetera. And what's going to happen is they intermix into the European population. These African men have sex with European women and vice versa, et cetera. And they change the complexion of Europeans to various degrees in these European nations. Spain and Portugal get it the most, most likely, because Spain and Portugal are in closer proximity to Morocco. England, Austria, and Germany, they get it, but not as much, because they're further away from where the Moors are going in. Um, when we look at the transatlantic slave trade, and if you watch the interview that I did with Professor James Small, Professor James Small confirmed this for me, because I asked him about this. And also, uh, when I was setting up the interview with uh, Professor Kaba Kamene, I asked Professor Kaba about this as well. He agreed with, agreed with me also. When we look at the transatlantic slave trade, there are two main ways to teach it. You can teach it episodically as an episode in history, like it just fell out of the sky. Or you can teach it chronologically. When you understand the transatlantic slave trade chronologically and you understand the hundreds of years, the history that preceded it, you understand the transatlantic slave trade is really Europeans getting revenge on the African Moors and Africans for what happened in Europe for hundreds of years. The fights, the conflicts the Moors had with Europeans, the Moors intermixing with the European population, changing the complexion of Europeans. The transatlantic slave trade is a continuation of those fights in the wars that the Moors had with Europeans. It's not something that just popped up out of the sky, no. And the dehumanization of African people did not start with the transatlantic slave trade. We see it happening in Europe with the Moors. And we see the way the Moors are being looked at, especially in Spain, we see it being changed in the, in the words that are being used to describe the Moors, like Maristo, which means little more. It's like calling it's like calling them a boy, like during segregation, well, how black men were called boys to, to dehumanize them. We see this not starting in 1440 with the Portuguese. We see it going prior to that with the treatment of the Moors in Europe. So the transatlantic slave trade is a continuation of that. But if you start, if you just start studying the history in the, in the mid 15th century, 
and you don't understand the hundreds of years of history that happened before that. This is why this is one of the books we use in the course. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Golden Age of the Moor. You got essays in here from Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who's one of the baddest scholars on the history of the Moors. He used to teach classes at Temple University dealing with the history of the Moors. Now he's at Berea College in Kentucky the last time I heard. And Berea is where Dr. Carter G. Woodson got his first undergraduate degree, okay? Because Dr. Carter G. Woodson had two undergraduate degrees. And I've got my book here on Dr. Woodson here also. Just give me a minute, I have four stacks of books here. Because I just taught a ses session of the class uh, the other night. This book right here, Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History. This is by Dr. Uh, uh, Pero Dagbovi, who's a history professor at Michigan State University. OK, this probably was one of the best books dealing with Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, who co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, who created Negro History Week in 1926. And it became Black History Month in 1976 and is now African-American History Month. Uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson um, got his first undergraduate degree, his bachelor's, his first bachelor's from uh, Berea College in Kentucky, and his se second bachelor's he got from uh, University of Chicago, okay? So when we deal with this history, and this is one of the problems I had with the whole 1619 project, New York Times did, and the articles from Washington Post, and this whole talk about August 20th, 1619, 400 years, et cetera, even though that history is important to understand. And it's good to have that conversation. And America does need a massive history lesson, especially if we're ever gonna get reparations because white people and African-Americans are ignorant of history. Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. You have to understand how a larger historical event is the culmination of a sequence of smaller events that lead to the large event happening. And what took place basically with the 1619 discussion not beating up on the sister who created the 1619 Project, but basically I saw interviews with her. Uh, but basically what happened with the 1619 Project is the hundreds of years of history prior to 1619 and the hundreds of years of African history, specifically Africans in Europe, that history was not talked about. So you think that African people first came to this land August 20, 1619. They didn't even, a lot of them didn't even deal with the fact that the Spanish were taking Africans into Florida and South Carolina about 100 years before that. Because the Spanish was, were involved in the transatlantic slave trade before uh, the British got involved. And the Spanish are kicking Moors out of Spain and enslaving some of the Moors. Some Moors flee. Some are going to stay in Spain. Some are going to be conquered and enslaved and they're taken into Florida and South Carolina. And that history was not even talked about. OK, Miss Giselle, Miss Giselle said, I prefer uh, Hidden Colors 5 over the uh, 1619 Project. Right. OK. Now, I'm not attacking the sister who created the 1619 Project for The New York Times. I'm, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the way they're telling this story is incomplete. It's totally incomplete. And the way that they're, they're telling this story is inaccurate. I know it's a lot of work that she that she did. And the work she did is a piece of the puzzle. But until you deal with the hundreds of years of history specifically, then when, yes, we need to go back to ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, things like that. But just specifically, 7-11 AD to August 3rd, 1492, you got to deal with that history. Because Columbus setting sail on his uh, first of his four voyages, August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina the Pentan of Santa Maria. Columbus is central to the spread of slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people, including African people. Because about 70% of the people Columbus encounters on his four voyages are African people. And Columbus is going into uh, uh, Haiti, what do you call it, Hispaniola, he's going to Haiti. San Salvador, what he called the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Panama, Jamaica, all this, all, and all these places are going to have slavery and they're going largely, many of them are going to have sugarcane plantations. But what people don't understand is sugar, the Moors introduced sugar into Europe. We also introduced rice as well. So all, all these things that we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. And the, all this stuff gets twisted around with the Africans known as the Moors in Europe. This is how all this stuff gets twisted around. 
So when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we have to deal with it chronologically. We can't deal with it episodically. We can't deal with it as an episode in history. You know, this book right here is an excellent book, a crucial book that, that I talk about in the class. And chapter two is, is extremely important, Before the Mayflower, A History of Black America by Lerone Bennett Jr. This was one of the books that they, was, that they cited in the articles uh, dealing with the 1619 Project. What a lot of people don't know, and Lerone Bennett Jr. talks about this in chapter two of his book, a lot of people don't know slave laws didn't, didn't, didn't even exist in the 13 colonies in 1619. So when people talk about 1619 and slavery, even though those 20 and odd Africans on the white line slave ship who originally captured in Angola by the Portuguese, and there's 350 on a slave ship called the San Juan Batista, and that ship gets hijacked by English pirates around Veracruz, Mexico, and 50 of those Africans are put on two ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. And the White Lion and the Treasurer come into uh, Point Comfort in, two, in uh, Virginia in uh, August of 1619. And uh, the Africans on the White Lion ship are traded uh, by the captain for food and water and supplies. Even though that did happen, these, these Africans were put into a form of indentured servitude because slave laws didn't exist in the 13 British colonies. Now, I'm not talking about the Spanish colonies. That's different. That's a totally different government. The first colony, the first British colony to have slave laws was Massachusetts in 1641. Slave laws don't come to codified slave laws. The, the first colony to have codified slave laws was Massachusetts in 1641. They come to Virginia in 1661. So the, so the whole way this history evolves is totally different than the way most of us think it evolved, whether we're African-Americans or whites, because most neither one of us understand history. Black people don't understand history. White people don't understand history. This is why if we're ever going to get reparations, America needs a massive history lesson because we're all ignorant of history. And then when you when you read Before the Mayflower, he talks about how African-Americans were voting in these colonies going into the late 1600s, going into the early 1700s. The, the free African-Americans, I'm not talking about enslaved African people, but free African-Americans, the whole way this history evolves is totally different than the way we think the history happened, right? So how can you, how can you seek repair for damage done and you don't understand the history of the damage that was done. Because that's what reparations is. Reparations is talking about repairing damage that was done. How can you seek repair for damage that was done when you don't really even understand the history of the damage that was done or the totality of it? Because you don't understand how this stuff evolved. So if you look at, um, very quickly here, how's everybody doing? Um, and then uh, let's see, somebody said, Giselle said, I'd rather watch Hidden Colors 5 than 1619 Project. And you can, uh, we posted the link here. You can order Hidden Colors 5 from our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And you'll get three of my, three digital downloads of my lectures, um, recent lectures I've done with each copy of Hidden Colors 5 you purchase. And it includes um, Black Migration, 1619 to 2019, uh, from the birth of a nation to the red summer 1919 to the, Detroit race ride in 1943 because black migrations is this year's annual theme for African-American history month, black history month. There's a theme each year for black history month. Most people don't know this, which is why a lot of these black history month celebrations, um, how should I put this? A week. I know people put time and effort into them, but they lack a real understanding of history and purpose. So the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, co-founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, September 9th, 1915, has an annual theme for African-American History Month, which gives you guidance on how to celebrate it, and it gives you purpose. They've had an annual theme since 1928. So people should, people should go to asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, asala.org, and research this. And they also give you guidance on how to teach this history in the classrooms. OK, so at our African-American History Month celebrations and in our classrooms for the month of February, we don't have to keep recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year. This is why a lot of our people don't want to go to these celebrations. Right. But the people who organize and mean well, they just lack the proper resources and lack guidance oftentimes. 
So uh, my presentation, my main presentation for African American History Month dealt with this theme and dealt with this history. OK, the, the red summer of 1919, when you had over 25 major race riots in this country, the year after World War One ends and African-American men are coming back home with a new sense of pride, a new sense of dignity called the new Negro. And they were called race men. And these white men are coming back and they can't find jobs because these jobs are being in the factories are being filled by African-Americans and immigrants coming to this country. And this leads to over 25 major race riots, racial explosions all across this country, like the Chicago race riot of, 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 of uh, July uh, uh, 1919. OK, the the uh, uh, the race riot that took place in Arkansas when you had over 200 sharecroppers who were killed. Uh, Elaine, Arkansas, the Elaine, Arkansas race riot in 1919. And they were organizing. They were unionizing to get better wages. All right. And you had African-American men who learned how to fight and how to shoot in World War One. And they're coming back home using those skills to defend themselves and their communities. So, after, so, so former, world, former black World War I veterans played a crucial role in the Red Summer. So it was called the Red Summer by James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP. Now, this is the same James Weldon Johnson who wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing that became the Black National Anthem. And it became the Black National Anthem because we knew the White National Anthem was not for us. This is why I don't stand for the white national anthem. This is why I support Colin Kaepernick in his protest and still support Colin Kaepernick in his protest. This is why I haven't watched the NFL game in three years. And I'm not going to watch an NFL game until Kaepernick gets hired by a team or he or he retires. And if he doesn't get picked up by an NFL team, I may never watch an NFL game again. So. Let me see. I'm trying to find this portion here. Okay, yeah. Um, if we look at page 37, I'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute here, right? Uh, we got Carl, Andres, uh, journals of Jade News. Um, let me go to this right quick here for you. This is chapter two of Before the Mayflower. All right, by Lerone Bennett Jr. And what page is this? This is page 38, okay? Additional evidence of the relatively high status of the first American blacks is to be found in colonial documents, which indicate that they voted and participated in public life. It was not until 1723, in fact, that blacks were denied the right to vote in Virginia. Okay, this is the county of Virginia. This is long before the American Revolutionary War that starts in 1775. According to Albert E. McKinley, African-Americans voted in South Carolina until 1701, in North Carolina until 1715, and in Georgia until 1754. Not only did pioneer African-Americans vote, but they also held public office. All right, so he goes and deals with this. So. The whole way this history evolves, right, is, is totally different. The whole way we think this history evolves is totally different than what actually happened. But African-Americans are ignorant of history. White people are ignorant of history as well. OK, and this is how you can have somebody like a Donald Trump who keeps lying to white people. And some of them keep believing him. Now, more and more, he's losing support from the farmers. Because of his tariffs, he's losing support from uh, uh, he's losing support from white suburban housewives because of the treatment of uh, 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 migrant children in detention camps, and a lot of these detention camps are private uh, are, are owned by private prison operators like Core Civic and Geo Group, and they donated almost six hundred thousand dollars to Donald Trump's twenty sixteen campaign. This is something I deal with in the, in my. A presentation that was six principles of political self-defense to talk about follow the money because private prisons were losing money under president obama because of but because of the decrease in people in prison overall right now they're looking at contracts for private prison i mean for detention camps for the migrant detention camps and they're making a lot of money from the contracts for the migrant detention camps. And these were Donald Trump supporters. So August 
of 2016, President Obama announced that they were not going to renew federal contracts for private prisons. When that news came out, the stock price, because these are publicly traded stocks, the stock price for Core Civic and Geo Group dropped significantly. Donald Trump gets elected by the Electoral College that we don't understand. We, that's why we had to read the U.S. Constitution to understand Electoral College. Donald Trump gets elected by Electoral College. He comes into office. He says he's reversing that policy. He reverses that policy. The stock price of uh, Geo Group went up about 98 percent. The stock price of Core Civic went up something like about, about like 148 percent. And then they were getting these massive contracts to house migrants coming to this country. Follow the money. Now, what I find interesting, and they talked about it this morning on uh, AM Joy, Joanne Reed. In Mississippi, when you had the Cook, KOC, is, it, it, now this is not Coke, this is not the Coke brothers, and when the Coke brothers just died, you know, uh, I ain't gonna talk about that. But um, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, but this is Cook Foods, KOC, this is Cook Foods, right? Mississippi, you had about 600 undocumented immigrants that were arrested. None of the people did the hiring were arrested. None of the owners of the company were arrested. Why is that? If you want to stop undocumented, uh, if you want to stop the flow of undocumented immigrants coming to this country, those who are coming who are actually undocumented, if you want to stop the flow of that, start arresting the people who are hiring. Start arresting the white people who are hiring, hiring them. Start arresting the white business owners who hire them. And it will stop. But they don't want to do that because they want to keep exploiting their labor. Donald Trump is one of them. Because Donald Trump is a known fact that he hires undocumented immigrants, has been for years. He has them working at his golf courses and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, golf courses and resorts in New York and New Jersey. OK. And there have been recent articles that talk about this. All right. So why isn't why, why isn't Trump talking about prosecuting the 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 owners of the companies who do the hiring of undocumented immigrants. And why isn't he talking about prosecuting the people who do the hiring? No, what white supremacy does is it pits groups of oppressed people against each other to keep fighting one another. So the 1% stays in power and profits off of the chaos and profits off of the exploitation of different groups of exploited people. So this is, this is all a game that's being played. All right. It's all a game that's being played. So this is why we have to be smarter than this and understand the game that's being played and game recognizes game. All right, let's go to some more of your questions. OK, Tajiri said yes. Almost love your T-shirt. Yeah, queen of the land. Queen of the land. Yep. Giselle. All right. All right, so everybody be sure to register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is an eight-week, 16-hour online course, okay? It's regularly $130. It's on sale $80. As soon as you register, you can watch the first three classes because I just did class uh, number three. And this class meets on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all right? We do the classes live at our online school. All the classes are recorded, so you can go back and watch them over and over again. So as soon as you register, you can watch the um, first few classes. And then also there's about 36 hours of bonus content also, okay? Um, so, and we do a thousands of years of history. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, a ton of information for you. Uh, considering the fact that we are coming up on another election season, do you know of any solid plans of action for us to support outside of the tangibles? Okay, hashtags. All right, this is one of the things I talk about a black agenda. A black agenda is not something that we that we wait on candidates to present to us. A black agenda is what we present to the candidates. A black agenda is not what the candidates present to us. A black agenda is what we present to the candidates. To be able to present an agenda to the candidates, you have to assess your current position. You have to assess your current status. To be able to assess your current status and position, you have to understand the history of how you got into that predicament. So you have to understand history, you have to understand law, because all this deals with history and law. So 
um, we need to look at some of the recent black agendas that have been presented. Some people may not like them. Some people may have never heard of them before. We need to look at the, and, and what happens is a comprehensive agenda needs to be put together that is backed by various African-American organizations across the country. It can't just be one person. It can't just be Dr. Claude Anderson with an agenda. That's not going to work. And he'll tell you that. Dr. Claude Anderson is one of my teachers. He'll tell you just him with a damn agenda ain't going to work. Okay. It has to be backed up by organizations. Here's some of the agendas that we need to look at. Of course, look at Power Anonymous by Dr. Claude Anderson. Okay, that's one of them. But it has to be put into a, um, it, it has to be updated and put into a format that serves a couple of purposes. One, an agenda serves a purpose that it gives you a standard to uh, measure the candidates by. And we have to look at the policies of each candidate, whether it's president, U.S. House of Representatives, and U.S. Senate, because all of it is important. And unfortunately, many of our people don't understand the power of the U.S. Senate. And a lot of our people don't understand Moscow Mitch, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, who's the Senate Majority Leader. This is what I'm explaining to people. This is what, what I'm uh, explaining to people who are fighting for reparations. I'm like, y'all do realize that Moscow Mitch McConnell said reparations is dead on arrival in the U.S. Senate. So even if H.R. 40 passes the House of Representatives by a vote of 420 to zero or whatever it is, he's already said there's no discussion of reparations in the U.S. Senate. The bill that Senator Cory Booker wrote dealing with reparation, that's not even up for discussion because the Senate majority leader controls the, uh, which bills are debated on in the Senate and which bills get a vote on the Senate. So Repub uh, Democrats took over the U.S. Senate January 3rd, 2019. They were sworn in. There have been close to probably about 300 bills that they passed in the, in the House. OK. There's only maybe about 100 so far that have been passed in the Senate. But the last time I checked. Is about four weeks ago. There's only been about uh, maybe probably now about 40 bills that have been passed by the House, passed by the Senate and signed into law by Trump. So when I hear people talk about. If this presidential candidate doesn't support reparations, I'm not going to vote for them. I'm like, um, we need to focus on the Senate. Because reparations has to pass the House and the Senate before it gets to the president. Even just H.R. 40, even just a bill to study reparations. OK, it's going to have to pass the House and the Senate. Before it gets to the president to be signed in the law, if, 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 if you're dealing with. If you're dealing with something that has to pass the House and the Senate, now, if you're just dealing with something that just has to be approved by the House. And it's a study, not a law, just a study. OK, that's different. But then if it's going to become law, if reparations are going to become law and actual benefits are going to be disseminated, it's going to have to pass the House, the Senate and the sign of the law by the president. And to pass the Senate, it'll probably need 60 votes and not 51. So the question I ask people is, do you, do you understand how many white people got to vote for this? For this to be come law, you understand how many white people got to vote for this? So unfortunately, many of us just look at the president and don't look at Congress. And if you read the Constitution, you know that based upon the Article One powers of the Constitution, you read the Constitution based upon the Article One powers of the Constitution, you understand that the purse, the purse strings are controlled by Congress, not the president. That's why we have to read the Constitution. That's why we have to understand law. The Congress controls the purse strings. The president submits the federal budget to Congress to be approved. Uh, there was an article. Let me see here. There was an article I read at the time. There were 33 laws, 33 bills that passed the House, passed the Senate, and was signed into law by Trump. It may be about 40 now. 
the overwhelming majority of the bills that um, the House of Representatives are passing are dying in the Senate because they're dying in the Senate because uh, Mitch McConnell controls the Senate. Okay. And so when we look at the uh, agendas, okay, because we're talking about the black agendas and, and um, a lot of people don't understand uh, black agendas. A black agenda is what we present to the candidate, not what they present to us. So it gives us a measuring stick to measure the candidates by. We need to go to their websites, not just for president, but for the House of Representatives and U.S. Senate. Look at their policies. See how their policies line up with what our issues are, what our concerns are. OK. Uh, two, it gives us some type of roadmap to operate based upon as well. So here are a few agendas that people should look at. Yeah, look at poweronomics, okay? Um, the Congressional Black Caucus in March of 2017 presented a 125-page agenda to Donald Trump, to the, to the Trump administration, not just Donald Trump, to the Trump administration. And it's called, uh, We Have a Lot to Lose. We Have a Lot to Lose, okay? And I have a copy of it in my backpack because uh, I travel with it. It's called, We Have a Lot to Lose. Uh, hundred, um 21st century solutions for black families. We have a lot to lose. This was, this was a 125 page agenda that the Congressional Black Caucus presented to the Trump administration. A lot of people don't know about this. Some people saw the coverage of it, right? But a lot of people didn't read it or don't know it exists in a format that they can read. You can download it for free. Go to cbc.house.gov, which is the official website of the Congressional Black Caucus. OK, I downloaded it, took it to a printer, got it printed up. Here's a link to it in PDF form. You can read this. We have a lot to lose. Solutions to advance black families in the 21st century. It's a powerful, powerful agenda. It's a powerful document. Um, the first thing they do on page eight is they lay out some history dealing with African-Americans and how we got to this predicament. OK, page eight. And um, so then they so they talk about slavery, reconstruction, the Great Migration, the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, uh, Jim Crow, civil rights. All right. Then they lay out issues pertaining to the African-American community, everything from voter suppression to uh, pay disparities, wealth gap, all the types of things like this. Then in the third section, they lay out all this legislation that specifically addresses the issues that were created by historical events and laws and policies. Now, most of our people don't know this exists. When it first came out, I talked about it on radio here in Detroit. When the meeting took place with the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus, there were seven members of the Congressional Black Caucus leadership who met with the Trump administration. Roland Martin covered this on News One Now because Roland Martin was there in the meeting covering this. OK, and if you go to Roland Martin on YouTube, you can watch the actual coverage of it he did and he interviewed some of the members of the cbc afterwards it's a powerful document most of us don't know it exists but there's information in here and there are policies in here that every african-american organization across the country can gain something from and use that to put together an agenda in their own communities because all of our organizations should have agendas for the local level county state and national level all of our organizations whether it's a block club whether it's a local chapter, the NAACP, whether it's a, a local grassroots organization, all, all, all these organizations need to have some type of agenda. So that's one. There was one that um, August 2013, 60 civil rights organizations presented a black agenda to the um, uh, Trump, I mean, to the Obama administration. OK, this was August 2013. Now, they should have done it before President Obama got in office, they should have done it at the beginning of the his first term, but they didn't do it, but they did it in his second term, okay, August 2013. And this was about a 33-page agenda. And um, what was the name of this one here? Um, I'll get you the name of this one. I forgot the name of this one here. This is called um, 
This was presented August 23rd, 2013. I read articles about this. Crew of 42 has uh, the agenda there. It's called 21st Century Agenda for Jobs and Freedom. African-American leaders convening national policy priorities, okay? 21st century agenda for jobs and freedom towards a new civil rights movement for economic empowerment and justice. This is 36 pages, about 36 pages. So it's not as, so the, the one the Congressional Black Caucus put together is a better one and is more comprehensive, okay? But this was, um, uh, this one here was more of a start, but we, we need to look at this as well. Most most people don't know this exists, all right? And this is why when we look at a Black agenda, it has to be from a perspective of being proactive as opposed to reactive, okay? So a Black agenda is something that you have. A Black agenda is not just something that you have during an election year. <laughs> a, a Black agenda, an African-American agenda is something that we have that we operate based upon, period, regardless of whether it's an election year or not. All right. So this is 21st century agenda for jobs and freedom. And there was about 60 civil rights organizations. There, there were articles written about this, about 60 civil rights organizations that helped put this together and back it. OK, supported it. So read that also. Uh, but all of our organizations need to have. Uh, some type of agenda that they're operating based upon. And yes, there can be a national, um, th yes, there can be a national uh, black agenda. And then there have to be modifications to it on the local level because African-Americans in Chicago, out of the 10 top issues of African-Americans in the country, African-Americans in Chicago can be dealing with three issues that we don't deal with in Detroit or vice versa. African-Americans in Brooklyn and Queens and New York, they could be dealing with issues that we don't deal with in Chicago and uh, Detroit. All right. So you have to understand how also it has to be modified at the local level to uh, to address the needs and concerns of the people as well. All right. Yeah, we have to be proactive and reactive, but to be proactive, you have to understand history and law. All this deals with history and law. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, the adoption, interpretation and enforcement. Laws come out of historical events. They laws are written to address conditions. Conditions are created because of policies and laws and historical events. And because of because of conditions, movements will take place to address conditions. Because of segregation, segregation was a legacy of slavery, okay? Because of segregation, the civil rights movement happened. Because of segregation, Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court case happened. That decision comes down May of 1954. Because of Brown versus Board of Education, when the uh, Montgomery bus boycott uh, takes place uh, starting Monday morning, December 5th, 1955, it starts as a one day economic boycott, but it lasts 381 days. The uh, leaders of it, the Montgomery Improvement Association and attorneys like Fred Gray felt that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional because the because the, uh, the what was set a precedence for this was Brown versus Board of Education. So they wanted to test the constitutionality of segregation on, on the buses. So February 1st, 1956, they file they file the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale which in the four plaintiffs in Browder versus Gale were really as Aurelia as Browder. Mary, Le Mary Louise Smith, Susie McDonald, and Claudette Colvin, four African-American women who at various times refused to give up their seats on buses in Montgomery, Alabama, okay? And they were arrested, thrown in jail, things like this. So they filed the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale, February 1st, 1956. This lawsuit goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. And on December 20th, the final verdict after appeals comes down that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional. The Montgomery bus boycott launches the modern day civil rights movement. But this was in reaction to uh, 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 segregation, in response to segregation, which were laws in various cities, laws specifically, we're talking about Montgomery, Alabama, but this was a legacy of slavery. And we know that Alabama was one of those former Confederate states that took up arms against the union in uh, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, six weeks after Abraham Lincoln becomes President-elect for the Republican Party. The Republican Party was formed in 1854 by groups of abolitionists 
who were the counter to the Democratic Party because the, the, the groups of abolitionists were fighting against slavery. So you have movements that come out of conditions, conditions created by laws. So you have this circle that takes place. So you have to understand history and law to understand how to put together an agenda to address the conditions that you're dealing with. And you're talking about laws and policies put in place to address these conditions. That's why history is so important. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. All right. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, follow us here on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, at our website, all my DVD lectures are there. Um, I have over 40 lectures. We have the new bundle pack. It's a six DVD bundle pack of all, all of my recent presentations. The Black Migrations, um, 16, 19 to 2019 bundle pack. And those are, it's uh, six presentations I've done this year, 2019. That's on sale, $50. All this helps to support the research, helps us keep doing the research, pay the bills, stay on air, do our Sunday night shows. Um, helps cover expenses when I have to travel. If you like this type of information, if you want to donate to the African History Network, you can do that paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or uh, at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, also you can order Hidden Colors 5 at our website, uh, africanhistorynetwork.com when you order it. You'll get three of my uh, dig digital downloads of my presentations automatically free with it as well. OK, um, and then I have to upload the new audio podcasts of various broadcasts I've done. So when you uh, our our broadcast on eight different podcast platforms, eight different audio podcast platforms, we're on iTunes, CastBox, Acast, FM Player, uh, TuneIn, uh, a number of different podcast platforms. Okay. So wherever you get your podcast from, we're on Stitcher also, wherever you get your podcast from, just search for the African History Network show, the African History Network show, and you can uh, uh, listen to me, take me wherever you go. And also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage, click on listen to podcast that connects you to our audio podcast. Because most of these broadcasts I do, whether on Facebook and YouTube, I'll put them in audio podcast format also okay so uh that we posted the link here for the black migration six dvd bundle pack that includes uh six of my presentations i've done this year and let's see okay miss watson uh as community we absolutely have responsibilities as well andre peace to the family how you doing miss giselle said love this all right good good Okay, so let's see, post this link here. We got that. And um, I'll be doing some more broadcasts this upcoming week. Got to deal with uh, some current events. I've been in and out of town so much, so I haven't been able to broadcast as much as I want to. Uh, so look out for that as well. All right, so look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. <laughs>